ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ಬೀಜ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ let us meditate on the supreme reality present in all of us om peace 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 so our topic today is a psychological approach to spiritual life <coughs> so normally when we Uh, discuss spiritual life <coughs> we have one very common perception <coughs> the spiritual life is often uh, considered to be some kind of an idealism <coughs> of course spiritual life is not possible without linking our activities our thoughts and ideas to some higher transcendental ideal this what distinguishes spiritual life or spirituality from empirical life or empiricism <coughs> but at the same time spirituality is not just idealism idealism has got one problem it could uh, take us away from the world of realities we may be living in a, in some kind of an intellectual ivory tower its opposite is pragmatism that is still worse one of the greatest enemies of spirituality is pragmatism in its most uh, despicable grossest dimension is called the utilitarianism i am not referring to the teachings of uh, j.s mill or bentham and other uh, western thinkers who are who are exponents of utilitarianism who defined actions and ideas and values on the basis of maximum amount of pressure that they bring to 
human life. If something brings to your life some practical utility, which again is a kind of pleasure at the very sensory physical level, becomes a criterion for judging the value of anything. That's not what I'm actually referring to. I'm referring to pragmatism as an attitude that we practice in our life. Those who are not familiar with the teachings of Bentham or Jasmine. Because if we interpret everything in terms of practicality, then we may either become animals or machines. These are only two options. Machines are very practical. Now, machines function according to the intelligence that you program into them. Machines are predetermined. So they practice some kind of ascetic predeterminism. So, if pragmatism or practicality begin to uh, govern our ideas and attitudes, then life itself will be totally uh, deprived of its beauties, its charms, its, uh, its meaningfulness or relevance. Because unless there is some kind of an unknown, some kind of a transcendental, some kind of an ideal, to which we link our life and actions, life itself has no meaning. Life will have no charm unless there are challenges and there are, again, this possibility of the unknown. In a society or in a way of life which is rooted in pragmatism, everything is predetermined. It is having to cut through predeterminism, almost like a, like a machine. So spirituality essentially uh, involves leaving behind a lower, uh, lower, a bunch of lower attitudes, including pragmatism, rather lower ideas or ideals, and moving towards a positive progression towards something higher and transcendental. I can give an example why this is important. Frequently, in systems and ideas and theological systems, where spirituality and religion are defined in terms of leaving behind, just leaving behind, without moving forward to some higher ideal. Leaving behind the lower, without actually moving towards a higher. There's a great risk, you know. There is a, irritability is most practical result. I can demonstrate this in the light of an example, again from a classic Bhagavad Gita. There is one verse, yukta ahara vikharasya, yukta cheshtasya karmasu, yukta sopna avabodhasya, yogo bhavadi dukkha. Means here, definition is yoga. What is yoga? Yoga is moving towards higher life, linking ourselves, uniting ourselves to some higher transcendental ideal. That's what yoga actually means. This yoga, or practice of this yoga, destroys, removes sorrow, grief. That's the literal meaning of the last part of this verse. Yoga bhavadi dukha. Dukha means that which uh, destroys. Dukham handi means that which kills, removes dukkha, grief, sorrow, kind of uh, aimlessness in life. So that is real yoga, which takes you away from grief. And then the first three verses are very important from our point of view, from our context. It's, it uh, expounds the ideal of moderation. Yukta means moderate, even, in a state of equ equanimity. So you, our eating, yukta ahar, means what we eat. So food is not only what we eat. Shankaracharya is credited with having made a unique contribution to the very concept of food. He was, he was the most unlikely person to interpret food, in fact. He was a higher spiritual philosopher. But he says, food is not only what we eat or what we're drinking, it's also what we think 
which is what we think, our thoughts, the ideas that we imbibe eh, are much greater food because they determine the way we think, the way we function, the way our emotions function. Just as the food that we eat governs the kind of physical body that we, we have. It should be moderate. That's the central teaching of this verse. Sukta means moderate. Based on yoga, that's literal meaning. So our food, food that we eat, and also the, thing, or the thoughts that we think, the words we speak, and our sports, our activities, everything should be moderate. So even spiritual asceticism should be moderate. Otherwise, you know what happens. To give an example, the people who fast do a lot of austerities. At least in India, you find in traditional circles. But then they'll be very bitter. See, I'm eating only once a day or once a week. These fellows eat four times a day. What, it, what sort of gluttons they are. Now, what they need, they should be forced to eat four square meals every day. That's only remedy for this disease. So, that means just leaving behind a lower ideal without moving towards a higher ideal makes us irritable in our life. It is not spirituality. People who do that kind of extreme asceticism, there are some old, of course, they're much less now than in early days, but still there are some ascetic cults who practice tremendous physical austerity, almost some kind of a life-negating kind of austerities. Now, that kind of practice doesn't make them spiritual. That's very obvious because they complain, these pe people these days in modern times, they use technology, the they have, no, they can't, in, in our early days, our grandfathers could walk 20 miles a day. Now they can't walk even five miles. They need modern vehicles, modern modes of transportation. Whatever we could eat, we had no problem. These days, people had to eat organic food. So uh, civilization is going backward. Now, what, if, what, what happens here is they are leaving behind a, 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 the gluttony, sensuality, but they are not progressing towards spirituality. So that creates irritability. So spirituality essentially involves these twin movements, moving away from a lower ideal and much more important, or at least as important as this, moving towards, progressing towards a higher ideal. If we progress towards a higher ideal, we can practice austerity with joy, with complaint, without any, without any, uh, any in, inner irritability. Now, <clears throat> I can give an example of uh, how uh, mere physical action with great mental concentration helps a person to leave behind a lower ideal and to move towards a higher ideal. It's again the best way to expound a great ideal, a great uh, philosophy is to use an illustration. And if that illustration is a story, all the better. So I'm taking one story from Chandogya Upanishad. It's a very interesting story. You know, in ancient times, uh, Vedic education was uh, was uh, was compulsory for all uh, boys, were girls who were born in traditional Orthodox families. <clears throat> so this is a very interesting, a touching story. One part of the story uh, doesn't have much spiritual significance. But the later part of the story is very profound. A little boy, one day, goes to his mother and tells his mother, 
I want to go to a Vedic hermitage to study the Vedas. So in those days, you know, the small boys used to go to hermitages. I mean, mostly retired householders who are great scholars, who have um, reached the, I mean, the evening of their life, will retire to a forest hermitage, husband and wife, when they become old, and used to spend the rest of the lifetime in contemplation and meditation. And they used to spend their time teaching Vedas to the growing, the new generation. Okay, so one day a, a little boy comes to his mother and tells her, I want to go to a forest hermitage to study the Vedas. Satyaka moha japalo japala mataram amandrayam chakre brimajaryam bhavati Ivatsyami, King Gotro Nuhamasmid. This is the first mantra. It comes in the fourth chapter, fourth section. <clears throat> the meaning is this I want to study the Vedas. Now this, he's, he's continuing his dialogue. To what Gotra do I belong? Now he throws a very interesting um, flashlight into the system of education prevailing in those days. Let's say about 5th million MBC. So when you want to study the Vedas, you should proclaim to your teacher the particular Vedic tribe, the Vedic group that you belong to, or the particular Vedic tradition that your family preserved. That's very important. So this little boy, Brahmacharyam Bhavadi Vivatsyami, King Gotra Naham Pashmiti. To what Gotra do I belong? Because the teacher will ask him, what is your father's name? And what branch of Vedas did your family cultivate for centuries? That's the background. In answer to this, the mother tells a terrible truth. She says, I don't know your father's name. Now in those days, and of course now also in traditional circles, it is the most terrible, the most shocking truth that a boy will be able to tell anybody. But the boy was very simple. That's an that's a interesting part of the story. That's a spiritual content. The boy did not know what it really meant in civilized society not being able to tell who, who your father is. And in, in the Vedic tradition, it was the most horrible thing. So anyway, the little boy did not know what it meant. He went to a forest hermitage, and the, the name of a sage, his name is Gautama. The sage asked him, as usual, you know, the great sage Vedic scholar will ask the boys, what branch of Vedas did you cultivate? In fact, these Vedas, you know, they were all well, uh, preserved through oral tradition in family circles. And they all memorized. So that's why not only Vedas, the, the, the India's the Sanskrit grammatical system, the logical system, all these things were preserved. Even Buddhist teachings were preserved for the first 80 years by the Buddhist bhikshus, Buddhist monks and nuns who retained in their memory Buddha's preachings, uh, which were in Prakrita language, which they retained in their memory. So last time, about a month back, I gave a talk here, the philosophical link of mindfulness. The philosophical link of mindfulness is Buddha's famous discourse on per perpetual awareness. Stiti Upatthana Suttam. It is called in Pali. Stiti Upasthana Suttam is called in Sanskrit. It was retained in memory. It comes from Abhidhamma by Buddhist monks. It was recorded in Pali script only 80 years after Buddha's passing away. And we are talking about an age which may be 4,000 years before Buddha. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, they used to preserve all this in memory. Now the boy said, 
boy told the teacher what his mother had told him i don't know my father then the teacher looked at the boy's face he was so innocent so bright so great then he made a statement tam ko vaach naidat abrahmano vivaktu markati meaning is that a person who is not a brahmin cannot speak a truth which is so uh, i mean uh, is so uh, uh, shameful apparently which will bring bad name to him so he speaks something which is truth but is a horrible truth so a person who speaks out the truth with such uh, integrity honesty He is a Brahmin. Who is a Brahmin? Brahmin is one who tells the truth. That's how Sankara Chaitanya interprets. The Brahmin is one who tells the truth. How this boy, through without depending upon God, without going to a temple or a church, without making any formal prayer, how he made his journey, psychological journey. through his own mind to the highest spiritual realization that is the burden of the story so samidham somi akara uvatva nishe na satya daga idi tam ubaniya krishanam abalanam chadushyata ga nirakrudam ti uvaja somi anusamprayadi i i won't i won't i uh, this verses in a chandogya i won't uh, explain everything i want to concentrate on the topic right now psychological approach to spirituality so okay the story is this the teacher agreed to initiate this is to boy to vedic wisdom spiritual wisdom vedantic wisdom how did he do that he didn't ask him to go to a temple and pray he gave him 400 weak lean cows and asked him take these cows to the forest to the forest when the total number reaches 1000 you can come back that is spiritual education psychological journey to spiritual realization so the little boy took all these four cows sorry 400 cows to a forest and with great care with great attention he looked out on the cows with so much of attention he bathed them he milked them he fed them and with great care he didn't know how long it took with great care the little boy took proper care of this 400 weak lean cows the teacher's instruction was when the total number reaches 1000 you return teacher told him when the number reaches 1000 you will have realized the highest spiritual truth how do you explain this that is the profoundness of the story <clears throat> with great attention he believed the teacher's words so much of sincerity so much of integrity so he can find how his mind evolves begins to evolve how he reaches the highest spiritual realization how his mind begins to grow with him and then after some time after several years suddenly he heard a noise it was a bull that is coming forward towards him a big bull it was a lit it was the son of a of one of the battered lean cows that he was looking after but but he put his whole mind and soul and attention on looking after the cows for him there was no god there was nothing only the teacher's instruction which he literally practiced putting his whole mind mental physical energy into practicing the teacher's instruction he did not think be anything beyond that he believed in the truthfulness of the teacher's instruction and as a result of his wonderful exertion 
the number is 1000 one bull came forward after some years look here satyagama his name is satyagama the one who loves the truth we have reached 1000 now you can take us back to your teacher so one bull told him it is not a bull we will, go, we will deal with subject the meaning of this uh, this episode later and a bull came forward and started preaching taught him some very fundamental spiritual truths some truths of spiritual life and that bull concluded his instruction after me somebody else will come and teach you after so many years so after the bull's instruction he started driving the cattle to his teachers home and on the way every day he will meditate he will do the oblations before the fire you know offering with great concentration <clears throat> and one day evening he heard another no voice that the fire appeared before him the fire god so to speak the bull was air it is called in vayu means the, the air principle so you see the story may look a bit mythological but we are coming to the profound significance of these instructions the bull concluded saying after me fire will come and teach you so fire appeared before him as a teacher and taught him this the Uh, the, the some other part of vedantic teaching and then fire told him after me a bird will come and a swan will come and teach you and he continued driving his cattle towards the teacher's home some distance away from the teacher's home a swan appeared a swan also gave him another set of instructions and then the swan concluded its instructions another bird mudgu is a story will also teach you finally a a bull the fire god the i mean the the god of air bull the god of fire and uh, this swan and another bird mudgu taught him this is the story goes now what does it really signify as he practiced a very 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 ordinary work of looking after cows for bathing the cows feeding the cows driving them to the great the great grazing field every day bringing them back taking care of them from wild animals the tremendous integrity honesty and concentration with a pure intention with full faith the teachers uh, instruction that made a change that made that st- started a process of spiritual evolution in his own mind his mind began to evolve how can our ordinary physical action have a change in our mental system that is the subject here so if we doing washing clothing or ordinary physical actions without apparently any formal spir- spir- religious ceremonies can they bring about a change in our mind our mind begins to evolve it becomes more and more pure through concentration and also through this integrity total faith complete faith and complete honesty this little boy began to become slowly by degrees a great spiritual teacher that is the story there so how can physical actions uh transform physical energy into spiritual energy how can physical actions 
not meditation mind is physical actions like cleaning baking the cows feeding the cows taking them to forest grazing or what you call apparently all secular actions nothing ceremonial nothing religious about it no prayer nothing how can such actions first transform our physical energy or mental energy into spiritual energy and slowly action ceases to be actions actions almost become meditations <clears throat> because such actions produce a tremendous spiritual capital so even the grossest physical action which has got meaning only at the physical level will have a higher meaning when those actions are imbued with or uh, they when they are infused with with a spiritual attitude they become a productive a creative spiritual energy that is the greatness of the story so the elevation of the mind uh, the the evolution of mind from psychological to spiritual level it was made possible not through meditation but through physical actions physical actions we cease to be physical actions when they are performed as spiritual uh, forms of spiritual worship this is what happened to him now the last part of the story is much more important at the end of this episode uh, this student little sad little boy satyagama finally reaches his teacher's home no the teacher uh, 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 immediately notices the difference in uh, on his mental of his uh, of his look his attitude the serenity the wisdom that reflected on his face the way he uh, asked him questions immediately the teacher told him satyagama i didn't teach you anything i only asked you to look after the cows so how could you how you already become a man of spiritual wisdom how was this transformation possible did somebody teach you then satyagama told him well somebody other than you taught me a bull a fire and uh, two birds swan and mudgu another bird but it was by your grace could you explain that your grace means it was you who gave me this job so i i i wanted spiritual instructions from you and the spiritual instruction that you gave me was look after the cows 400 cows you can got those so for me it was not looking after cows not just bathing or feeding the cows for me it was like prayer and meditation so every time when he fed the cows try to protect them from wild animals all days became a spiritual practice for him and this continued spiritual practice which means this looking after cows made him a man of spiritual wisdom but i have one request i have learned all this but i want to learn from you what i learned from them now look when when uh, actually bull didn't come to him or fire didn't come to him or swan or madgu the birds didn't come to him at all what really happened was when he practiced with great attention and concentration with a very ordinary secular job of looking after the cows the intensity of his concentration and his full faith and the sanctity that he attached to this ordinary work of looking after cows that made his mind something other than the mind that transformed his physical energy mental energy into spiritual energy so the vo- he did not hear any voice the voice came from within himself bull didn't come and teach him 
the instructions that came from the bull came from his own mind the instructions that came from the birds and fire did not come from the birds and fire but they came from within his own mind as he began to evolve the his own mind became the great teacher the great instructor and then because he was so humble he knew he had learned the truth but he he tells his teacher now it is true i have learned but that's not enough i want to learn that from you because one once we learn something from a teacher the teacher not only teaches you the instructions the teacher transforms into you something which can come only from a teacher you know if there is a 1 mm uh, gap between a burning fire and a tiny uh, lamp unless the wick of the lamp touches the burning fire the fire cannot be transformed from the burning blazing fire into the lamp there should not be any gap something is transformed from something else what is transformed is not lost but it is gained on the lamp when the lamp takes its illuminating faculty from a blazing fire by coming in contact with it the blazing fire doesn't lose anything but the lamp gains it so after learning all days the student tells his teacher sutam heva hevami bhagavat drishebhya acharyatha eva vidya vididam sadhishtam prapati iti so tasmai kha etat eva uvacha atrahana kinchana viyayeti viyayeti is the last verse so the meaning is this i know i have learned it but i want to learn from you because unless i learn from you it won't be real learning now we can learn many things but we can't teach others what we don't learn from another teacher so there are many uh, people who get uh, who get education by them their own effort the spiritual science unless you get this teaching from another source you can't use to play the role of a teacher unless the blazing fire is fire it cannot trans transmit that fire into another lamp so this is the end of this dialogue so here what do you find is yes, psychological pilgrimage that students mind, students mind itself begins sets on a pilgrimage and as a result of this when he begins to do the work of looking after the cows not as the work of looking after the cows but as an act of spiritual practice meditation then you what happens the very ordinary act of looking after the cows produces spirituality within the mind that's why the uh, the teacher tells him you have already learned what you should have learned but the student tells him that is true but then that is not enough how do we practice in our ordinary life so you don't have to go to a temple or a church but it cannot be a concept the teaching should be properly imbibed for that we have to begin somewhere teacher and when he so humble he could actually listen to the if he had looked upon this as a duty as looking after this this as a spiritual act it became an act of worship in modern times perhaps the greatest problem we are facing is you know the this this scattering of mind the information pieces of information disconnected information running right within the mental system which uh, this which doesn't prevent we doesn't allow us to link ourselves to a higher spiritual idea so this transformation of 
physical action, the physical energy, the spiritual energy is possible when phys physical activities are linked to spiritual idea. Scattering of information is one important obstacle that stands in the way of linking our action to spiritual idea. <clears throat> For that we need a higher idea. Because once we believe in an ideal, it immediately organizes our energy resources. Not only the physical, psychological level, but even at the spiritual level. At a physical level, we can integrate our energy to achieve a physical act, physical achievement. At the intellectual level, if we can have a higher ideal and if we can orient all our intellectual activities, mental activities in that direction, then psychological mental energies get organized, focused in one direction, we can achieve great things. Similarly, if we can link our physical and intellectual activities, a spiritual ideal, then physical and intellectual ideas themselves produce spiritual capital. That's why even at the end of it, he has become truly spiritual. He, may, he proclaims the teacher, Acharya Thaeva Vidida Sadhishtam Prapati. This learning which I got, which, which I got from within myself, apparently the bull came and taught him. Bull's words came from within himself, his own mind. His own mind instructed him. But the Upanishad puts in the language a bull coming forward and instructing. The fire did not speak. The words that he, received, what he heard from the fire came from his own mental state. a great teacher. Mind itself became a source of wisdom. The mind ceased to be mind. Mind is linked to the Atman. And then, you know, mind is no more mind. And mind becomes the Atman. So the reality, the truth, manifests within. That's a, that is the basis of Swami Vivekananda's great famous definition of religion. Religion is the manifestation of divinity already in man. Complete rejection of tabula rasa, John Locke. Absolute, complete rejection. We are not born with an empty slate or empty table, literally speaking. We are born, apparently we, we are not able to be aware of it. But once we begin to transform our ordinary physical actions into something other than physical, by linking those actions to a spiritual ideal, then the physical actions become spiritual sadhana, spiritual practices. When this happens, we begin to hear voices from within. But there is one difference. Swami Vivekananda has got a funny statement, not in this context, but is very apt in, in his uh, inspired talks, which he gave in, in Thou Thousand Island Park, in New York. Swamiji makes an interesting point. If somebody comes and tells you, I'm inspired, and speaks trash, reject him. That is the lit that is sentence. What is trash? Suppose somebody says he's inspired and then says things that create division, conflicts, quarrels, fightings, discord. Then that is not inspiration. At least it's not an inspiration coming from God, maybe it's from somebody else, maybe. So inspiration that or rather intuition that happens as a result of inner, inward, mental, spiritual pilgrimage is nothing but the manifestation of divinity, divinity that should be underlined, and already that also should be underlined within man, because it is within and is it divinity, and it is creative, productive, it is humanizing, it is unifying, it is stabilizing, it, it makes for tranquility and peace and uh, welfare among everyone. 
When we reach that stage, we feel peace within, and this peace we begin to manifest in our actions, interactions with others. The same story, the same principle is expounded in another Upanishad, Taittiri Upanishad. That also is relate like a little boy. That's also very interesting. The same principle you find. There, a boy, his name is Bhrugu, goes to his father, who is his teacher. Bhrugu vai varunehi varunam pitaram upasasara adhihi bhaguo brahmi. That's how it begins. A little boy, Bhrugu, he goes to his father and ask him to teach him something about spiritual life or the ideal of spirituality. The father again uh, sets him on a spiritual journey at the psychological level, mental level. Tells him, well, you look around and see all these things, the valleys, mountains, rivers, happiness and happiness, hunger, thirst. So, Andam Pranam Chakshustrotram Mano Vajaniti is a given. Means, and I mean this material world, the empirical things, phenomenal things, energy, mental phenomena, psychological phenomena, like happiness and happiness worlds and so on. Where do they come from? Where do, what's the final but the, uh, the origin of this empirical, this thing that you see around you. You don't have to think profound. Look beyond it, see around you. Where do they come from? And how do they, how are they sustained? What sustains them? And what happens to them in the end? You can meditate. So the insertion we saw, Tapo atapyada. The instruction is, see, he says, tapasa brahma vijikya saswa. You try to understand this through inner spiritual journey, which is called meditation, practice of morality, turning every action into an act of worship, and then practice of mental discipline non-violence, contentment. Through all this, you practice meditation, and slowly you will, re, you will ascend to a higher level of consciousness, beyond the physical, to the mental, to the energy dimension, to the intellectual dimension, and finally you reach the spiritual dimension. This is possible through this psychological, pilgrimage, but should be undertaken with a lot of inner discipline, moral discipline. Mind should be uh, disciplined. Mental uh, emotions, psychological emotions, physical actions should be linked to a higher spiritual ideal. Then they, then they get disciplined, they get organized. Every mental or psychological or physical action begins to produce spiritual energy, not physical energy alone. And then it helps us to the, reach the highest spiritual realization. So the story of Satyagama is unique in many ways. It is a very profound story. Apparently it's a very ordinary story. You know? A boy is instructed to look after cows, 400 cows, weak, lean cows and he takes them to the forest but for him there are no more cows they are objects of worship he doesn't worship them literally what he does feeding the cows taking care of the cows protecting them from wild animals all these become for him a spiritual act of worship he was no more looking after cows. He was undertaking a spiritual pilgrimage. So when he finally progressed, his own mind slowly becomes 
spiritually saturated and that mind throws up higher ideas and those ideas are uh, symbolically figuratively explained as words coming from bull fire and so on. so anyone can practice this apparently it is simple but to undertake that simple journey we had to undergo a kind of very complex training that is our mind should be infused with the highest degree of honesty sincerity truthfulness and again mind should have only one layer frequently you know the problem is mind has got multi layers with one layer of the mind we can read the scriptures or we may take this thing seriously with another layer of mind all right this is all right fine but there are some practical things which which don't agree with these ideas so very often you know as we do when we walk in the street how are you actually is one thin layer of the outer one outer thin layer of the mind operates how are you we don't if somebody ask you how are you today that person won't wait there to listen to you well i'm fine today he may have already walked away so it's only one thin layer of the mind so that should not be your attitude in spiritual life it should be one single intense layer so this little boy had only one layer practically so with that he just listened to the teacher and what the teacher told him for him was the the mean the gospel truth and he practiced so that enabled him to reach the highest spiritual realization that's a unique message of the story so if you are many more things to discuss we will have an interaction maybe after the lecture in the way kind of hall during q and a you can discuss this subject so thank you namaskar om shanti 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 hari hyun tatsu sri ram krishna namaste <coughs>
now we have announcements <coughs> there will be no lecture next sunday because of a special program on saturday the next sunday lecture will be on may the 7th on buddha's contribution to world talks child care is provided during our sunday lectures on wednesday evenings we have vespers and meditation at 7:30 pm there will be no friday evening class this week class will resume on friday may the 5th so please remember there will be no friday evening class this week class will resume on friday may the 5th special announcements our annual pilgrimage to shanti ashrama will take place next saturday april the 29th the all day program begins at 11:30 am and will consist of worship talks and discussions devotional singing special displays and a tour of the ashram our special guest will be swami varadananda of the vivekananda vedanta society of chicago all are welcome to attend programs are available in the lobby on sundays all are welcome to use the library from 12:30 to 2:30 pm you and your friends are cordially invited to attend all of these services as usual after the lecture there will be a question and answer session in vivekananda hall and all are welcome <coughs> ശാന്തിരന്തരീക്ഷ ശാന്തി പൃഥിവീ ശാന്തിരാപശാന്തിരോഷധയ ശാന്തി വനസ്പതയ ശാന്തി വിശ്വേദേവാ ശാന്തി ബ്രഹ്മശാന്തി സർവം ശാന്തി ശാന്തിരേവ ശാന്തി സാമാശാന്തിരേധി ആൻഡ് ടു ദ ഹെവൻ ബി പീസ് ആൻഡ് ടു ദ സ്കൈ ആൻഡ് എർത്ത് ദർ ബി പീസ് peace be unto the rivers the waters unto the herbs and the trees be peace unto all the gods and everyone in this world let there be peace unto brahman and unto all be peace may that peace be unto me and prevail everywhere om 